all the talk ahead of that game was the fact that Aaron Ramsey wasn't included. It was a knee problem for him. There was no Socrates, and Emery said he wasn't quite ready. And Mesut Ozil wasn't well again. Um, it's an ongoing saga. Martin Keown has said it's embarrassing what's going on with Mesut Ozil. What on earth can the club do to try and, to try and fix this? They have a, a clearly talented player there who they, they can't seem to use. And either he's, he's ill or the manager doesn't want to pick him. I think it may be a bit of both, really. I don't, I'm not sure uh, Emery's a huge fan of him. I have seen him play one game at the Emirates. I can't remember who it was against, but he was absolutely out of this world. But there's not been enough of that, Kelly. Probably over the piece. I'm a big fan of his. I like the way he plays the game. There's times his body language lets him down, you know, and he has this sort of very laid back or almost sulky sort of body language. But when he's on song, he's a world class player. But he obviously doesn't fit into the way that Una Emery wants Arsenal to play. And it's looking more and more like his days are going to be numbered there. Um how difficult is it going to be for Arsenal to offload a player who's on huge wages, who isn't able to play his way into the thoughts of, of any teams that, that might be interested? It's, it's going to be very difficult because Arsenal need to make the decision. You know, if we're going to get rid of him, we need to play games yeah, to show everyone how good he is. If we don't want him, we're going to have to sell him, but who's going to pay the wages? So it's, it's a catch-22. It's becoming a bit of a comedy sketch at the moment because we know how talented he is. And if you speak to the Arsenal fans, I think no doubt they'd turn around and say, yeah, we want him in the team. The manager decided, well, I don't really want him in the team, or I do want him in the team. He doesn't work hard enough, or whatever. But sometimes when you have that kind of luxury player, which he is, I think some of the boys in the team will be more than prepared to work a little bit harder to get him on the ball to produce that magic. I mean, Arsenal, over the past years, especially when Wenger was there, the players did that. So we could produce that little bit of magic. You know? Arsenal not a team for me personally that are going to win the Premier League in the next four or five years. You know, we've got to be brutally honest there. But you've got to play your best players when you need them. And Ozil is definitely one of the best players. Is there, is there a case for having a player who might be arguably the most talented or most naturally talented in the squad, but, but not having a place for him? Is there, is there, are there times when it just doesn't fit into what you want to do with the team? Yeah, maybe, maybe on one or two occasions, but certainly not over a concerted period of time. I and mean, when you have a talent like that, Again, it may come down to man management as well. You know, he, he, I don't know what kind of personality Mesut Ozil is. You know, he may be a, a complex character. He may be difficult to manage or he may be easy to manage. Or he may just need a bit of man management. But he's certainly, you know, been over the last few years a divisive character. You know, he's, he's like marmite. Some, some love him, some, some don't love him. But for me... I love that, watching that's them not play. the Marmite phrase. <laughs> <laughs> some love him, some hate him. Yeah, no, I didn't want to, you, I know, you can be I too strong you, a word, you know, because I'm quite used to that myself, yeah. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he's that sort of character, divisive at times. He, he, he does get criticised a lot for, for his work rate or lack of work rate, but whenever I've watched him play, he covers the ground quite well, you know, and his stats are quite up there with distance covered for, for many midfield players. Again, he may not fit into the plans, he may not be what he wants, but he'll certainly find a place somewhere because he's definitely got the game. And the thing is, we are just going to keep on talking about him until this is, till this is resolved. He doesn't go because he's not well, he doesn't go because he's, he's not part of Emery's plans, and every week it's a, it's a different reason why Mesut Ozil isn't, isn't included. It's, it's, it's very strange, and you know, it could be one of those ones as well, you turn and say, the deal, should Arsenal actually have done the deal? Mm. You know, he's, he's getting to that stage now. Did they keep him because they was losing so many other players on that, their contracts and that? But also got themselves in that, in that uh, predicament. If you look at Ramsey now, Ramsey's going on a free. I'm not being disrespectful. How many players like Ramsey are going to go on a free? You, you can't replace that. And if you do, he's like 40, 50 million pounds. So also got themselves in that predicament. I think they might have got themselves in that predicament with Ozil. And they've ended up giving him the contract. And many people might have thought, oh, we could have got rid of him or whatever. Now they're stuck with it. So it's, it, they might look at it and say, well, Emmy might look at it and say, well, it's a bit of a pill for me to swallow because if I was the manager, then I wouldn't give him that contract. But it's water under the bridge now. He's got enough to work with it. So he either plays him or they, they try and sell him, sell him sorry, and recoup some money. They're also struggling to score away from home yet again, Arsenal. Is, is there anything they can do to fix that? Is, are they getting the opportunities? Have they got the right players in there? What, what's happening? They've got... Fantastic strikers. Lacazette obviously mm -hmm. played all but five minutes of, of the game. See, and that's what we've been sitting about talking about, you know. The geezer's not playing. 
Ozil. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's got the quality. If, if you ask Lacazette and Bayern, do you want to play? They'll say all day long. All day long, because he's going to create those chances for those boys to score goals. You're talking about playing away from home and not scoring enough goals. When you've got creativity like him, Ramsey not playing, you're going to struggle to create chances. So you, you've got to have those which are perceived as their best players on the football pitch to create those chances for those boys to score goals, not just for the two centre forwards, but for the wide men to score goals as well. So it's, it's, it's really, really strange. And I, I hear what Martin Keown's saying, you know, because looking from the outside, I'm half saying to myself, what is going on here? You, you've got to play them. If I'm a centre forward, I'm saying to myself, please, manager, just pick him. Is that the point mm -hmm. that Martin's making, though? It's an embarrassment that he's not, yeah. he's not picking him? Because you, you've got to make a decision, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, if you're not going to play him, come out and say, look, if he doesn't figure in my plan, you're going to send him at the end of the season, or you say you're going to play him. Because if you can't score goals away from home, you're going to struggle to win football matches. And I, think I think that's the point he's yeah. making, is which it, is just, just, it needs to be sorted. sorted. Yeah. Ramsey's one of them as well, Andy, will go yeah. beyond the strikers. You know, and that's good in the modern game. He of will course. get in the box and on the end of things. And he's going to Juventus. So it shows the calibre of a player that's, that's walking out the door for nothing. Um, let's talk about Celtic. 2-0 defeat for them at Celtic Park. Valencia beat them in the Europa League. It's only their second defeat in nine matches at home in Europe. You know what those yeah. big occasions, those yeah. big European nights are like at, at Celtic Park. Is, is it just a blip for them? I think we'll be disappointed. You know, they've been on a great run domestically since the turn of the year, since the winter break. And I think there would have been, you know, good expectation going into the game that I think they needed something at home, you know, because historically, even when I played or managed away from home, we found it difficult either in the Champions League or the Europa League. I think, you know, everyone was looking for some sort of platform to take into the second leg. However, Valencia are class side, you know, and I think they've only lost four games all season, so it was a tall order. They've been in the Champions League this year of, in the same group as Man United. So... It's no disgrace, but I think there'll be a tinge of disappointment. In terms of will it affect their season, I don't think so for the domestic running because they've been in imperious form and that, and Brendan's done a remarkable job there. And that, that's the thing, they were given a bit of a fright, like you say, before the, the winter break, but they've yeah. managed to put together a really impressive run of results to, to put six points ahead at the top of the Scottish Premiership. Yeah, I mean, they lost the, the old firm game, you know, just before the break, and the Befair Rangers played very well that day. And I think that might have been the kickstart that they needed again because they've been not conceding goals, scoring a lot of goals, playing some great football. And this is a step up in class. Let's not, you know, you know, beat about the bush here. Going from the Scottish Premier League to La Liga side, one of the top La Liga sides, who've got a great tradition in the competition and in Europe. You know, it was a good test for them tonight. I w would have expected them to maybe nick a goal or, or get some sort of result to take over there, but... Obviously, Valencia must have played very well on the night because Celtic have been great at home. And that's the thing, it's that their home results have been the ones that have been able to, to carry them through the, the European competitions where they, they have managed to progress. So a defeat at Celtic Park is, is going to be significant for them. Yeah, it's um, a big disappointment losing at home because, like you said, you always expect Celtic to, to get, a, get a goal or win the game at home and then go away and, and, tr and try and nick something. But it's role reversal this time. Mm. And, you know, like Lenny touched on, Valencia are a good team. They've always been a good team, you know. They've gone for a few problems and that, but they've always had good quality players. And I think them going to Celtic Park this evening and sounds like they won comfortably in the end too. No, you know, it's going to be a tall order for Celtic. While we're on the subject of the Scottish Premiership, mm -hmm. Neil, you can't talk about your exit from Hibs I for can't. legal reasons. <laughs> annoyingly, however, <laughs> you can talk about what you've learnt from it going forward and 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 looking to what towards what you want to do. I had a great time at Hibs, you know. I took the job on when they were in the championship and a lot of people were raising their eyebrows, but there was great potential there. So we had a great couple of seasons, you know, getting promotion and then get, you know, finishing fourth, a couple of semi-finals. You know, we got the crowds rolling back in and we had some great days and we played some super football. So, you know, that's at an end now. I'm looking forward to the next challenge. I'm enjoying the little time off, but you get into a routine, yeah. Andy, you know, when you're coaching and you, we're institutionalised. It's, yeah, like being in, so. it's like being in the army, yeah. you know, and then you come out into civilian life and you're sort of like knocked off kilter a little bit. Ideally, I'd love to get back into management, but it's such, it's, it's difficult now. And every job's precious, you know, and uh, you see the calibre of people that Andy's working with Saul Campbell, mm -hmm. you know, starting at Macclesfield, mm -hmm. you know, Paul Schools has gone in at, at Oldham. So every job's precious, so hopefully an opportunity will come up, you know, on the horizon. But um, at the minute, I'm just enjoying a bit of time out, and um, I'm appreciative of what I had at Hibs, appreciative of what I had at Bolton, 
I certainly would have had a Celtic as a manager. I know you say you're enjoying the time up, but you don't sound like you're enjoying it when you talk about missing the routine of it, missing the day-to-day -day life. Where, where would you look to, to get back into it? Well, it, it, there's not much in Scotland there for me to do, I don't think. So, you know, again, you look over the border or you look abroad, you know, and, um, you know, I've had European experience with, with Hibs, mm -hmm. believe it or not, and obviously with four years at Celtic as well. So they were great experiences. So I've got that on the CV, but ideally, you know, back to England would be fantastic. But um, if, if an opportunity came up that I really fancied, even abroad, then that's something I would look at. And that, that idea or that, that openness to, to moving abroad to work, is, it's quite a, a new concept for, for British managers. It's not been something that, that British managers have, have done regularly throughout the years. Is that what we've tended to see is, is British managers saying, there's too many managers from elsewhere coming in to manage yeah. in, the, in the top divisions over here. Mm. It's, why do you think there's, there's now... Because you, you're starting to hear managers talking about it more. Why do you think there's been that that shift, that, that looking to, to further Maybe horizons. Maybe because it's becoming more difficult for British managers mm. to get a, back into, either a step in the game or get back into the game because there's a lot of foreign ownership and, you know, clubs are looking down, you know, the German model maybe or the, the Spanish model or the Portuguese model. And that's fine, that's their prerogative and with a lot of clubs it's been successful with other clubs it hasn't. And I'm just thinking, you know, if there's not an opportunity to work at the level that I would like to work at, then maybe look at America or or somewhere in Europe or or somewhere in, in the not the Middle East, you know, even the Far East, Australia. Anything really. I'm not desperate. <laughs> no, the, you I'm don't not, sound I'm it, but you do sound enthusiastic. But, oh yeah, I, I love the game, yeah. you know, and I love I love the management, love the coaching. It's never dull, you know. You get so many highs, and the highs are high, the lows are lows. There's no sort of grey area in between areas of management, and. I feel at 47, I've still got the energy to do it, you know, um, still young enough. And this man here's obviously got plenty in him as well. So for me personally, take a bit of a break. I don't think it's the right time to go back in straight away and just have a look at things maybe next season. That idea of broadening horizons, though, is, is an interesting one, Andy. I saw you nodding while, while Neil was talking. Do you think mm. that's, that's what managers are, are doing increasingly now, is, is looking further afield? Why not? Um, players are doing it. Uh, the younger players they decide, you know, they're not getting the opportunity in England, you know, let's go to Germany or wherever it may be. And, and as managers, yeah, it, it broadens your horizon, you know, it, it gives you an, another opportunity to look how they manage abroad, you know. So if you do get the opportunity to come back to England, you can bring that experience with you. So I, I, I think if that's what managers want to do, why not? Why not give it a good go? Paul Heckingbottom's gone in at, yeah. at Hibs now. What, what's, he, what's he getting from the, the group of players that are there? Good young group. Yeah, they've been a bit inconsistent this season. But, um, you know, they can still comfortably make the top six. They've got a quarter-final of the cup to look forward to against Celtic. So there's plenty, plenty there still for Hibs to play for this season. So I, I wish Paul all the best. Good luck to him. And, it, and in terms of the way... I, I know it's, you've only just left them, so it's, it's not the easiest of, of questions for, for you to answer politically. But in terms of the, the club that he's, he's going into, what can his expectations be of, of what they can, can give to him? Well, top six, you know, and, you know, hopefully a good cup run for them. So at the minute he's going in at a decent time, albeit off the back, they've had a couple of defeats in the league, but they've, they've won, the, won through the, the quarter final. And now it'll be important that the support staff are there for him, obviously to give him a rundown on the individual players there. And obviously when he's done the interviewing process, he'll know what the structure of the club is. It's a good club, good city to live in as well, you know, and... Um, you know, I had a great two and a half years there, I really enjoyed it. It was good for me, you know, it was good for me and I hope I was good for Hibs.